All right. So let's get started and I will be brief to leave the, the floor to, to Nakul, who will talk to us about creeping uh, hill slopes. Um, a brief bio, uh, finishing a PhD in 2022 at the uh, University of Pennsylvania with Doug Jaromak, uh, which probably started some of the, the hill slope and creeping hill slope questions that Nakul is going to, to present us. Today, um, he continued with a postdoc at uh, NC State with Karen Daniels uh, in the Department of Physics, if I uh, am not mistaken. And right now, uh, Nakul Deshpande is uh, freshly tuning in from uh, Los Alamos, uh, where he just started a new postdoc uh, working on yet another topic, uh, environmental sensors in um at the national lab, but for us, he will uh, do us the favor to go back to hill slopes and how they creep to uh, close the academic year for um, uh, Landscapes Lives this year. We will start again uh, in the fall and uh, we will be uh, happy to uh, uh, release a program uh, over the summer probably, so you can expect some some emails about it. Uh, over the summer once we uh, put that together, um, probably starting in October with, uh, with the academic year. More information about that later. Nicole, please, the floor is yours. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Luca, for the intro. Thanks, everyone, for showing up today, this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be. And today I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, as, as Luca mentioned, uh, uh, I am currently a postdoc at Los Alamos National Laboratory recently a few few weeks ago, but the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is work that I did mainly during my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. But um, these investigations are, are lifelong. And so continuing the idea and the spirit of that work was conducted at NC State, some of the work at which I will I will share to you today. And the name of the, the talk is the perpetual um, fragility of creeping hill slopes. And this is like a, a conceptual um, way of thinking about creep and soil deformation in nature. Or by understanding a, a tiny, humble little sand pile shown here in a in a video. Um, let's progress. Okay, so mm, this is landscapes live. So uh, landscapes um, draw our eye due to patterns and magnificent shapes that that happen at the surface of the earth. So, for example, um, where I live in Taos, you can look at the Rio Grande Gorge, which is uh, the Rio Grande has carved and incised into basalt bedrock here, creating this beautiful canyon. But you don't get a, a feature like this. You don't get a landform like this without moving some sediment. And um, the movement of that sediment, the interaction of fluid and the cobbles at the bottom of a river, as shown in this video on the, on the right-hand side, now, this is a surface process. So in order to get stuff and shapes and cool things to look at at a landscape scale, you need stuff to happen. And that stuff that's happening is being accomplished by, by tiny particles, by, by sediment, essentially. And sediment is a granular material. And when we think about materials in general, we can classify them within a whole range based on their size and their interactions. And so instead of thinking, when you look at a, at a river, for example, and you think about something like bed load transport, um, the cobbles and the particulate matter and their interactions that give rise to a macroscopic behavior like uh, erosion, incision, and then the shape of the river itself, th that can be classified within a larger um, range of material. So in, this, in that same way, think about all of the tiny individual bubbles in your, in your latte, for example, or all of the emul emulsions in your, in your um, mayonnaise. Like if we classify all of these different particulate um, styles of matter, we have a, a different framework for understanding something like sediment transport, for example, by, by broadening our scope in terms of how we think of particulate matter. So granular materials and sediments that we find on the Earth's surface are athermal, which means that they're too big to really be disturbed by um, thermal oscillations and fluctuations. They're frictional, and their interactions are dissipative. You know, So this is a kind of technical way of classifying and situating granular materials within a, a larger class of particulates. And this may look really simple to you, you know, you can look at those cobbles and then you can look at these chickpeas or these seeds that are here and say, okay, well, that doesn't look so much like, uh, like it should be so hard or it should bear so much resemblance to what we see in nature. And this is kind of trivial or maybe simple because we're looking at a bunch of circles. 
But actually, let's situate something like sand, which is a granular material within a larger context of science itself, not just in particulate materials, but let's think about um, physics, let's say. So this is a cartoon created in collaboration with Karen Daniels, who is my postdoc mentor at NC State, um, and Randall Monroe, the popular science whimsical cartoonist, uh, situating sand along a continuum of areas of, of physics by difficulty. So we have Newton's laws, right? A little bit more difficult are the ideas of uh, special relativity, and then all of the rules of quantum mechanics in general relativity, but sand is more difficult than all of those things. So even though you have all of these humble grains that may look to be very simple, they're more difficult than understanding um, space-time. And if we extend this axis further to the right, and we consider areas of science by difficulty, not just areas of physics, let's consider hill slopes. Okay, so on the left here, you're looking at a slowly creeping hill slope somewhere in the world, and on the right is a hill slope that's failed somewhere in Brazil. Okay, and you can ask yourself a simple naive question, which is that if I just want to consider what phase of matter um, this hill slope is in, uh, is it a solid or a liquid? If I just take a, go out in nature and take a look at it, maybe it's not such a, a simple um, question to, to answer. I'm going to be talking today about um, creeping hill slopes. So if you go and just look at some random piece of ground uh, outside of your window, it doesn't look like it's moving at all. And the answer to your question may be, yeah, this soil is a solid. But if you place markers in the landscape, so for example, here you have fence posts that were originally installed perpendicular to the land surface. They've slowly been uh, tilted with time, which gives us an indication that uh, over long time scales or some time scale that's longer than our observation, the soil isn't solid, but it's actually moving, right? And this is this motion is maybe more liquid-like than solid-like. And indeed, under strong forcing, where there's a lot of action and a lot of drama, uh, for example, here, this is the aftermath of um, an earthquake in 2017, I believe, or 2018 in uh, Japan, where there was an earthquake that completely liquefied the hill slopes. I mean, it looks like the, all of these soils just... It's like someone poured a cake batter or pancake batter on the landscape. This is very obviously a liquid-like or viscous-like behavior. So there's a contradiction. There's an internal contradiction in terms of how we think of the deformation of soil and the conditions under which it transitions from being solid-like and not seeming to move at all and creeping very, very slowly and then fluidizing and flowing like a, like a viscous liquid. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is, is creep. And kind of classically, I, I don't want to talk about this too much, but I, I do want to tip my hat to the kind of classical conceptual formulation of, of hill slope creep in geomorphology. And it has old origins in speculations of G.K. Gilbert and uh, William Culling, who provided some um, field observations and some heuristic arguments to basically come up with a diffusion-like equation to describe the smoothing of um, the land surface with time. So this is just a numerical simulation of a diffusion equation, which is the um, functional form that they that they uh, included on to describe this evolution. Um, and you know, this model conceptually is very much tied to landscapes that are shown here on the right, these kind of smooth rolling uh, hills. Uh, the most canonical example in my mind are, are those in the Gabalon Mesa in California. And the way that this topography smooths out with time is through creep. And the big idea that underpins this entire um, conceptual formulation and also the, the theoretical mathematical formulation is that there are disturbances that kick grains of soil um, down the slope with time because otherwise the only forcing here is gravity. And uh, the soil particles on this whole slope should be frictionally stable under gravity alone and there shouldn't be any movement. So the only way that you get stuff to happen is to invoke disturbances. So think about um, bioturbation, little gophers kicking stuff around, or rain splash, or freeze thaw cycles, or other types of mechanical disturbances other than, than just the presence of gravity to get stuff happening and to get the smoothing of topography over time. Um, and this is very much uh, encapsulated in these um, experiments of, of Josh Roaring and colleagues who took a pile of sand and shook them quite strongly with an acoustic speaker to investigate creep and landsliding motivated by um, the diffusion equation and the diffusion, the soil diffusion framework. 
Um, it turns out that in these experiments, the grains were shaken quite strongly and creep was not observed. It was more of a fluid hydrodynamic like flow. I can talk about that a little bit later, the details are in the paper, but um, yeah, I'm talking about some experiments and I want to make those distinct from um, other experiments that exist in the canon of geomorphology that examine creep and landsliding. So, excuse me. So this is, this is the experiment. It bears a lot of resemblance to, to Josh's experiment. What you have here is a bunch of sand that's being poured in between two plexiglass plates. And in this image, you can see that the kind of duality of soil and granular materials in general um, is present. So if you look at this free surface, you see that grains are flowing out either end. And even qualitatively, you can tell that this is like a liquid. This is like the water that I just poured on my face, right? Like it's, it's flowing. And once you cease um, pouring grains into the system, nothing happens, right? Or even beneath this flowing layer of what appears like a liquid, you have a static bulk. There's nothing really happening. So there's a there's a partition between stuff happening and stuff not happening, or something that's solid and not moving, and something that's liquid-like and that is moving. And that indeed, when you pour the grains, or when you're done pouring the grains, there's no drama, right? This video continues to play, but there are no grains really, really dancing around here. And so this experiment is the dirt equivalent of watching paint dry. I'm gonna pour sand on this table. I'm just gonna let it sit there and I'm gonna see what happens because I, I have a suspicion and I have some feeling that maybe there is some more drama. <clears throat> but in order to do that, we need to expand our capacity for detecting creeping motions. So maybe our eyes betray us alone and we need some help from some other techniques to be able to measure very, very slow motions. So this is a picture of the experimental setup that I'm going to be talking to you about today that provides the backbone for all of the observations that I'm going to show you. It's called diffusing wave spectroscopy, okay? And the, sim the setup is mm, humble enough um, and looks real cool when you turn off the lights. And the idea is that we use this laser light to illuminate the sand pile and make some observations that allows us to measure creep, okay? So in our system, um, it's a little acrylic box with these dimensions. And the grains that we pour into the system are silica beads. So most of them are, are spherical, but there are some impurities of glass and so on. And the diameter of these grains are about 100 microns. And the basic idea of this technique, diffusing wave spectroscopy, is that you have a laser. And this laser creates an interference pattern called a speckle pattern. And if grains move, and when grains move, it changes the speckle pattern. And that allows us to extract the grain motions. And the grain motions that we extract are strains. They're volumetric strains on the order of 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 4. So these are really, really small, small motions. It's a quite sensitive technique. <clears throat> so what we do is we pour the sand out on the table, and we just let it sit there. So if this is in a laboratory in a basement in Philadelphia. We control the humidity the best we can. We control the temperature the best we can. And the only forcing here is the, is the gravity. That's it. It's just sitting there. And Actually, it's not just sitting there, it's creeping, it's alive. But this aliveness of motion is only able to be detected with this laser interference technique. So what you're looking at here is an animation for a few tens of seconds after this pile has been poured. There are no grains being added to the system. And the colors indicate the magnitude of the strain that's happening within each one of these little pixels, which is a volume that encapsulates about three grain diameters, okay? And the darker colors indicate um, more intense magnitudes of strains and the lighter colors are less in intense magnitudes of strain. And what you can see is that there are little popcorns, little zones, discrete zones of deformation that pop in and out of existence um, for the duration of, of this observational window. Okay. And if I look for a longer period of time, from the moment that I pour out much further, you can see that um, the rate at which this entire pile is creeping slows down with time. So what you're looking at on the right here is an, is an animation like the one that I have just showed you. And on the right is a time series that's showing you the average of the creep rate over a period of time. And you can see that there are both fluctuations, right? These popcorns are, are not steady in time. And by popcorns, I mean these little dis discrete zones of, of black and purple, right? These are little places that are rearranging, places where grains are slipping, right? and localized from the rest of the, the material. So there are fluctuations, and then there's also a decay with the rate and time. So although the system creeps under gravity alone, it doesn't creep at the same rate through time. And we can quantify this slowing down, essentially, of the creep rate 
by computing what is a correlation function, okay? So the way that I want you to think about this is that you can compute um, how statistically a speckle pattern at one time resembles a speckle pattern at another time, okay? And we can create a, a family of relaxation curves, each with a different age. You can think of this waiting time as an age, right? And that age, the sand pile is born when I'm done pouring the pile and it's just sitting there under gravity alone. And those are these light colors here. And as the colors get darker and darker, the sand pile is older and older. It's been sitting on the table for a longer period of time. And what you can see for the young sand pile, where the waiting time or the age is, is low uh, on the order of seconds, there is a decay, a quite quick decay. So this is on this uh, y-axis is, is the correlation. It's just the measure of similarity. And then on your x-axis is a, is a lag time that's telling you the time at which you're comparing the two speckle images. So this decay is very fast, which means that I lose resemblance very quickly. And that's because my sand pile is creeping more quickly at two seconds after the pile has been poured, as opposed to 8,000 seconds or uh, about two hours after the pile has been poured. Um, we can quantify this slowing down by extracting uh, our relaxation time for each one of these curves. And you can see that um, the time that it takes for this pile to relax grows as approximately a power law with time, okay? So my pile gets um, uh, slower and slower, it creeps slower and slower, and the way in which it creeps slower and slower is a power law with time. So we've repeated this experiment many times. I don't hang my hat on the um, one half power law. Um, most of them are, all of them are less than one though. So mm -hmm. There's nothing necessarily universal about this other than uh, this less than one relaxation. And this is becomes important because um, we extract this time and are able to use this time to collapse all of the data onto a single curve, um, which is a stretched exponential function, essentially. And the reason why that is important because the stretched ex exponential function is one that is generically used to describe the relaxation of glasses and glassy materials, okay? And so what I'm telling you is that the sand pile, as you pour it, relaxes like a glass. And we're familiar with glasses in a geological context. If you take a, a magma or lava and you supercool it, you produce obsidian, right? So in the same way that you're pouring the pile and you have liquid-like motion while there are grains being added to the system, when it ceases and the system freezes, the way that it freezes is akin to a glass, okay? And that's true both for this um, stretched exponential function that describes the relaxation. And it's also true for these tiny um, discrete zones of rearrangement. That's also true for, for glasses. So, okay, this happens all in an experiment, but what about in the field? I know that the field is very important. Uh, it's a bet, it's reality. Nature is, is reality. The reality also exists in the lab. It's real. It's not fake. These are real observations that I make. So what's the discrepancy or, or what is the connection between what you observe and what is a very incubated environment in the laboratory and then the wild mess of nature? So there are some explicit measurements of soil creep in nature, and they are conducted with these so-called uh, young pits, which are the, kind of this and you install a bunch of tracer pegs on top of each other. You bury the hole, <clears throat> and you come back some years later, you excavate the, the pegs, and you measure their displacement. And you know the period of time in which these things have been buried. You can measure their displacement with a measuring tape, and you can get deformation and velocity profiles of how fast the, the soil is moving. And these are the most explicit measurements of, of soil creep in nature that we have, okay? <clears throat> so as part of this work, I... Um, went into the literature and measured or extracted reported um, velocity profiles. So what you're looking at here is the depth from the land surface on the y-axis, and then on your x-axis is the velocity as measured by young pits. And they're very, very low velocities. So this is very, very, very slow motion. This is in, in, on the order of nanometers per second, okay? And you can also see that there is a, a decay with the velocity from the free surface. So the grains at the top are moving faster than the grains at the bottom. And it turns out that in our experiment, even though we don't explicitly measure velocities, we're measuring strains, we also observe this, um, this decay in, in the depth profiles. And it turns out that um, even in the lab and in the field, the rates and the style of creep all satisfy an exponential decay from the free surface, <clears throat> which is a cool result because it shows that mm, even though nature is messy and there's a bunch of stuff happening there, 
the rates and style of creep is similar to those that we observe in the lab where only gravity is, is, is the main actor. So the next question you may ask yourself in your mind is, okay, well, right, you're using these um, circular particles. So maybe what you're observing has to do with the particle type and real soils in nature are rough. There are interactions, there's particulate um, organic matter. So there's, if you're so uh, interested in the materiality and the granularity of the problem, like maybe what you're seeing is influenced by having uh, circular particles. So we addressed this problem by introducing a whole suite of particle types into our system using the same experimental technique, diffusing wave spectroscopy, as I um, explained before. So we used sand, glitter, kaolinite, coffee, like that you just get from the corner store, salt, sugar, pepper, you know, sugar, spice, everything nice. Uh, we threw it in the pile and you can see that there's a wide diversity in shapes that are encapsulated in these materials and then potentially surface interactions too. I mean, flour is a powder and you know that powders get sticky, they can clump up, they do all sorts of weird things, right? So <clears throat> we can ask the question, do all of these materials creep or is, or is there something about their material type that maybe frustrates or stop creep? And the answer is no, they all creep. You pour them all in the same system, you follow the same protocol of pouring them into a pile and you observe both relaxation and you observe these discrete zones of deformation that persist even though you're done pouring the pile, okay? So creep is not dependent on the type of material that you use. <clears throat> and just to give you an example, this is crushed silica, right? Where, where the grains are rough and angular. And these are maps of uh, deformation, animations of deformation that qualitatively show the same behavior as glass beads. I didn't spill, great, okay. And then if I look at um, <clears throat> kaolinite, for example, um, tiny uh, powder where I may expect some, some cohesion or some um, aggregate formation to happen, uh, creep still persists in this system as well. Cool. <clears throat> so that addresses kind of like a material parameters question, but then you can ask the question, okay, well, if gravity is all you really need for creep to happen, what is the role of disturbance, which is absolutely um, pervasive and present in nature? And so to answer this question, or to explore this question, we, we tapped our system very, very gently, right? So these are low amplitude taps that don't displace grains mechanically, but provide enough agitation to, to, to see motion. Um, so this is a visualization of the creep in response to a thousand taps. So you tap it a thousand times and then you observe during the duration of that tap, the, the response. So <clears throat> there's strain throughout the system and it concentrates at the free surface after many taps. And I think we tapped this something like 10,000 times and you can see that there's a, there's a decay, a strong decay of the response with increasing number of taps. So if I look at the system after it's been tapped nine times, most of the creep in the system has been uh, depleted, right? Like the magnitude of these strains are much lower than those at the free surface. So as you're tapping it, the interpretation is that it's compacting in the core and that compaction reduces creep, but the free surface is still free to dilate and respond to the, to the agitations. So if creep under gravity alone is a kind of relaxation, when you're tapping the system, it's a kind of accelerated relaxation, right? By compacting the system, you can make it creep slower than if it were just sitting under the influence of gravity alone. So you can tune the rate of creep depending on the type of disturbance that you use. <clears throat> so um, once hills fail, you know, they can flow like fluids or crack like solids. So like if you want a model uh, that reliably tells you how a particular hill slope is creeping under a gentle disturbance regime, or how hill slopes will respond to violent shaking from an earthquake, you know, you kind of have to ask the question, what classes of model do I use? Because uh, a diffusion equation isn't going to cut it, right? And the phenomenology of what is apparently static but what is also solid-like in the form of cracks in certain types of um, earthquakes and mass motions, but there's also viscous-like flow that happens. So um, it's not the most uh, rigorous thing to, uh, in an ad hoc way, to apply a fluid-like equation to something that's already filled like a fluid or to use a solid-like equation for something that's already filled like a solid, right? And this idea of a glass 
and looking to models of, of glassy materials may provide a potential solutions or avenues for finding alternative classes of models to, to take um, into the field for, for prediction, both for uh, landscape evolution, but also for, for hazard prediction and mitigation. And gives us some idea of maybe what we can look for in the field data, whether it's relaxation or whether it's discrete zones of motion that are precursors to catastrophic failure. And um, this also brings a question of like, what exactly is the origin of this motion? Like if you have this system that's just sitting under gravity alone and you don't need to give any juice for stuff to happen, like why does, what happens at all? And the key really lies in the way that granular materials transmit forces. So what you're looking at here is uh, just a snapshot from the stream map from our creep experiments, which show the dynamics, which show the creeping motion. But the thing that underlies the frictional stability of granular materials and the sand pile are force chains. So stresses in granular materials are not distributed in an even way. They are distributed in an uneven way through networks of contacts that people call force chains. And those force chains can be visualized in experiments like in the um, photo that I'm showing you below. And so the system is very similar to the sand pile that I'm showing on the top, but you're looking at acrylic disks that are squeezing each other from, uh, from the weight of gravity. And you can visualize these forces using um, some optics and the optical properties of the, the particles that you're using. And you can see that basically where these um, force chains are, are very light, it means that the stresses between the grains are high. So there are a bunch of zones where there are grains that aren't really feeling that much force. So you can maybe imagine that those zones are the ones where you have these dark areas of rearrangement um, as observed in the creep experiments that I presented. And if we extend that to our vision of hill slopes and what determines the stability of hill slopes in nature, it's not so much this diffusion thing. It's really considering this heterogeneous network of forces that are an invisible skeleton that give uh, the backbone and the rigidity to, to soils and hill slopes in nature. And if we really want to understand the evolution of topography over geologic time, these microscopic dynamics and these very literally granular details matter. Um, so this transitions into work that is that I did at NC State and that is ongoing with at NC State with um, Karen Daniels. And you know, I mentioned like what are some classes of of models that we may be able to look to to both like explain what we see in an experiment and also give us clues to what to look for in field data. And one of these models or one of these conceptual frameworks lies in the density of modes. So what you're looking at here is a simulation of a thermal solid that is being modeled as a ball and spring system, okay? So this is basically a way of um, simulating temperature in a thermal solid, right? And thinking about the vibrations within a thermal solid and how that gives rise to a bulk quantity, ooh, like temperature. Did you guys see that? That was crazy. And uh, remember that these granular materials are athermal. So they're too big to be knocked around by these thermal fluctuations, right? And considering all of the vibrational modes of a system like this is very important and has quite deep origins in the theory of solid state physics. And thinking about how all of the discrete motions and the statistics of these uh, individual molecules give rise to a macroscopic property like the heat capacity of a solid may give us a framework for thinking about how the tiny creep deformations or maybe vibrations that are present in, in soils, both ex experimentally um, and in the field, may give us a bulk property like the strength of a soil, okay? And so what I'm going to show you here is that, okay, although granular materials are athermal, there is a way and there is an argument to be made for thinking of um, using mechanical vibrations as an analogy for thermal motions. So what you're looking at here is a video taken in a photoelastic packing, the ones that allow us to visualize force chains like I should do in the previous slide. Did I just do peace and give balloons? Weird. Okay, so you have here embedded in this packing a piezo, right? You pass a voltage in this, in this piezo sensor and it vibrates. And that vibration 
makes a change in the force network. And you can see this force network breathing. So you can see the outlines of particles here. It's kind of a grainy video. But the point is, is that these grains aren't changing their position. They're fluctuating in, in place, right? In a way that is, one can imagine, analogous to the way that molecules in a the thermal solid are also vibrating, okay? So if the vibration amplitude is small enough to not make grains rearrange, then maybe we can use the idea of uh, mechanical vibrations as being uh, a swap for thermal vibrations. And that allows us a, a whole way of thinking about um, of granular materials in this state. And also it makes us think about um, vibrations and consider the vibrations in these materials. So this brings uh, me to experiments that I did at NC State where we are explicitly measuring the vibration of these grains. Okay, so this is a system very similar to the one that I showed you um, in all of the previous slides. And there's a piezo element here that provides a vibration to the system. And we can measure the velocity. So instead of having a unitless strain, a dimensionless strain, we have units and a direction that tell us exactly how grains in a region are moving and creeping with time. And the reason why we use the piezo instead of letting this thing relax under gravity alone is both the sensitivity of the instrument and the idea of providing a temperature to the system. So we want to, to give a forcing and then measure the response. In the laboratory, although we control things like uh, temperature and humidity uh, in the creep experiments I showed previously, we don't have a, a full relationship between the input of the forcing and the output. We just have gravity, right? That isn't a great control variable to work with. So by gently agitating the system in a way that makes creep, but not make it creep so strongly that it doesn't creep anymore, but that it flows, this allows us uh, a way to control the system and have a control parameter to explore. Um, and this is an example of the data product. Like we actually can have time series of the velocity and then perform all sorts of operations in the frequency domain to extract quantitative information about these about these vibrations. And this is ongoing work, but I'm just going to show a, a vid real quick of what one of these experiments looks like. Okay, this is an output of like the proprietary software of this vibrometer, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through what you're looking through here. You're, you're looking at this bottom section of the Fourier transform of the velocity time series for all for a thousand points, for, for many thousands of points taken within the sand pile. And this piezo is situated here, it's mounted at the bottom and it's providing what is a, a sinusoidal driving, a very weak sinusoidal driving. And what you're visualizing is the motion of um, each of these points if the motion was only comprised of the two kilohertz frequency band. Okay, so you have a noisy time series, right? I can do a Fourier transform on it. I can see the strength of each of the frequency contributions and I can visualize only that frequency contribution. Um, and the take home from this is that these tiny zones of rearrangement that were present in the creeping system from the DWS, the diffusing wave spectroscopy experiments that I showed you before, those discrete zones are also present in the system. And you can see that they're most concentrated that the velocity is concentrated most near where the forcing is, but throughout the system distributed uh, are the presence of these, of these um, popcorns. And um, analyzing these popcorns and, and analyzing the, the vibrational response in the frequency domain of these forced granular systems is, is ongoing work and connecting it to um, the density of modes and being able to connect this statistical picture of vibrations at the grain scale with a bulk scale measure of strength is uh, is ongoing. Yeah, and that's the work that I've been doing at NC State. So, okay, with that, uh, I think I'll conclude and thank uh, my funding sources, both at Penn and at NC State, um, and just finish and conclude with, with this video. And that's what I got. Thanks very much for your time and your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, this was really awesome. Um, I've just opened uh, the chat for people to uh, to type in their questions, um, but maybe uh, we'll just leave them if, uh, a few seconds, a minute or so. So I I would start with with a question actually, since we have this in front of us right now, Nako. The the size of these popcorns that we see here is that dependent on the the size of the grains? Is there like a characteristic number of grains that are going to make one of these uh, popping clusters? Or 
Yeah, that's a great question. So discrete zones of rearrangement like this are observed in other granular materials and amorphous materials, and they're always on the order of like three to five grain diameters. So that's just a rule of thumb for all of these things. Each one of these little pixels is about three grain diameters, but it turns out that counting these popcorns and their size is non-trivial in these experiments. So experiments like the ones that I showed at the end that make use of the vibrometer, Mm, they're more suited for the, the analysis of the characteristic of these popcorns. The other technical point is that in order to do the spatially resolved version of diffusing wave spectroscopy, you need to know something about the scattering characteristics of the grain, and that limits the boxes that you're looking at. So for the other materials, we don't actually have such a good idea of relating the grain size to the boxes that we should use. And um, yeah, that prevents us from, from making an explicit count of the, the size characteristics of these rearrangements. Yeah. But it should be done and it will be done in a different experiment. Okay, great. Thank you. We, we have actually a first question. Uh, maybe Anlo, would you like to take it? So uh, we have a, a comment from Bobby Sass and uh, says, great talk. How, how are you accounting for mixed signals of hysteresis when introducing a low V electrical current and strain thickening hysteresis and a non-Newton -Newton flow of the sandpile. Can I ask what you mean by um, strain thickening hysteresis? Okay. I mean, I guess you can start with the first one. So for sure, for sure there is um, like, hardening, like mechanical hardening. And maybe that's what you mean by the hysteresis. Like as you're forcing it uh, for a longer period of time, it's becoming stronger. So your your system doesn't have the same strength. In these experiments, I'm not accounting for that actually. Um, yeah, and I think that um, under the tapping, the system is uh, compacting. But if you increase the frequency and use sinusoidal driving or like white noise driving, um, my observation is that the pile maintains an agitated state that doesn't relax. But there's there's a sweet spot of the type of forcing and whether you get aging and relaxation or whether you get something that is at a roughly elevated and, and uh, fresh creep rate, let's say. But I don't have really good answers for like what range of displacements or voltages, right? The voltage is generating a um, displacement in the sensor, what that range is. I don't have a good answer to that question. Yeah, and in terms of the non-Newtonian flow, um, yeah, this is definitely a, like a rheology agnostic talk uh, or perspective, and I'm not ascribing a particular rheological view like a you know, Herschel Buckley or Bingham plastic type flow to this because those rheological models break in with these observations essentially. So that's why I'm moving to other um, other views of flow and materials that are outside of the complex fluid family. Yeah, that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Nicole, uh, that is is absolutely a fantastic talk. So I have another question here from Kieran Dune who says, fantastic talk. I am curious about the effects of the <clears throat> particle size distribution on creep rates. If I understand correctly, your experiments have a relatively narrow grain size distribution. What could be the effect of a wider or even multimodal grain size distribution? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Dune. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. It's true that the grain size distribution that we're using is quite narrow. In terms of how it affects the rates of creep, I don't know. But my suspicion is that um, you get maybe two different classes or size distributions of the rearrangements. Um, maybe one for the big particles and one for the small particles or for each mode of the grain size distribution. Or maybe you even get a stabilizing effect where the big grains take up all the action and the small grains uh, don't participate as much. I, I don't really know. I don't have a good. I don't have a good intuition for you, for for how that changes. Um, you know the. 
I want to emphasize that using the vibrometer for these experiments is like a huge uh, step up in visualizing the creep emotions because it explicitly gives us velocity and we can decompose um, all of the, the frequency contributions and we're not tied to this spatial binning that is um, present in the diffusing wave spectroscopy. So examining the behavior of different grain sizes and maybe how different grain sizes affect the prominence of certain frequency bands is like the way to start moving and thinking of these experiments. So um, I don't have a great answer or intuition for you, but I have a lot of hope in these new experiments and new experimental techniques to get at questions like this, which are very important. Thanks for the answer, Nicole. I would have a, another question, but from uh, Hannah Davis, who just sits next to me, and she will just say it out loud. Yeah, so I, I sat in on Luca. I'm, I'm sat in on the talk with Luca here. Uh, so I, it's a real shame that we don't have any any lunar or Martian science labs that we can go that you could go do this on to see how the creep changes with gravity. That would be really cool. Uh, maybe yeah. in the future. So, so uh, the the silica beads and a lot of the other things you're using are very small grain size. And so I'm wondering if you're approaching the kind of grain size where electrostatic forces start to become significant and whether that's affecting your creep rate and, and whether you're kind of, it, it, how much it affects your creep rate through time and your initial creep rate. Because obviously when you're pouring all of that silica, you're probably generating a lot of electrostatic forces, then it's kind of settling. And so is that, is the anomaly of creep just, would you see a more more straight curve if you had like a, non-electrostatic material. I mean, you do use some that maybe would be less electrostatic than others, but yeah, what's your, what's your question? What's your opinion? Great. Um, <clears throat> definitely creep is not the anomaly. My like mantra through all of this is that creep is everywhere, even if we can't see it, you know, like the whole surface of the earth is moving and in motion, even if we can't see it. So, but your question about electrostatics is very well taken. And there are coatings that we can use and that we used in these experiments to reduce the effect of electrostatic charge generation between the walls and between the grains themselves while they're being poured. And we still observe creep. Um, in, and you're very right also that the initial creep rate changes a lot. So in the paper that I referenced here with all of the materials, we repeated um, many, many trials of pouring all of these different materials in and observed wildly different creep rates. So how you pour, and how that generates um, forces and charge effects that aren't accounted for and measured and, and the consequences for the creep matter very much. My, my intuition is that those effects change the slope of the power law of the relaxation time scale. That's my suspicion, is that whatever physics that are dictating that relaxation, things like electrostatic charge generation or dissipation are embedded there. The other thing that I should mention is that all of these results, the discrete motions, the slowing down, um, and the exponentially decaying velocity profiles uh, were first observed in discrete element simulations of Belus Verdosi during his postdoc in Doug's lab. And uh, there are no electrostatic charges there. Uh, the only thing that goes into those simulations are the things that you prescribe to go in there in terms of forces, which are gravity and frictional interactions between the grains on the wall, and creep still exists, right? So um, these effects are important, and the way that they drive or, or contribute to the driving of creep are for sure important and present, um, especially if you're going to use very, very large grain sizes. Um, you know, you're departing from the, from the regime where um, small contact forces are important. But the results of the simulation give me some, some confidence that even with big grains that are only interacting via friction, this phenomena, phenomenology would still be present, actually. Um, yeah. And that these small surface charges are maybe akin to like what we're trying to do with the piezo element that's vibrating. Like it's the source of noise that is driving this thing to continue happening. Um, but that at the end of the day, maybe we can fold it under the blanket of noise. You know? But that doesn't mean we shouldn't study them. It just means that I think that right now that's my thinking is that I I, I blanket and put those all in the same, in the same camp. Okay, cool. Sense. Sense. Does that Thanks make sense? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, we also have a question from uh, Laurent Robert, who asks, uh, do you know if these popcorns have a fractal nature, nature? And if so, could this theory scale up to entire landscape creeping? For example, as landslides, um, as popcorns on a landscape surface? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know because I haven't measured it in this system. And I haven't measured it at the landscape scale, although I'm very interested in doing so. Um, you know, if they're fractal, then that means that you have rearrangements that go all the way down to a grain size to the like length of your landscape. I think there's definitely a size cutoff in terms of how big you can get rearrangements. You know, that that isn't the system size. That is something set by the grains and their interaction or chunks of land and, and their interactions. I don't know what that cutoff is. I don't know what that length scale is. And I don't know if you have a power law distribution of these things in the experiment or in the field or yeah, exactly what the length scale of the cutoff is. But it's a great question and definitely the next one that begs to be asked. Yeah. So thank you for that. All right. Um, we also have a question here from Harrison Gray. Really exciting work. Uh, how might the presence of an interstitial fluid, such as water, affect the creeping dynamics? That's a great question. Um, there are, luckily, I can point you to some papers by uh, Morgan Mousset, who examines creeping motion due to a weak Darcy flow in uh, packing of granular materials. And she, I think she has a series of maybe two papers and uh, that examines the, the relationship between the flow rate and the rearrangements and the relaxation of the slope. So the agitation of the pile due to the fluid flow is enough to get uh, like a, a decay in the slope and a relaxation in the slope. And um, yeah, creep still happens. I think that probably the flow paths where the shear forces of the flow through the grains are highest will lead to places where you have rearrangements. The relationship between that and also like the force strain structure, I believe that there are some papers, there's a recently published paper like uh, within the week of a large law th author list, I should have put the reference here, of the soft matter physics of the ground beneath our feet. And enclosed in there are contributions from many um, people in the soft, um, matter community um, who are working on problems and very interested in earth surface science, sediment transport, and so on. And I think there's another paper in there um, by Ruben Juanes and his group that looks at fluid flow in, in packings of photoelastic particles. I'm not exactly sure, but um, that would be another cool place to look at, at like these type of things and uh, fluid flow and the importance of fluid flow. Yeah. That would be great to to see. Yeah, sure thing. And you have a big, awesome, and thank you uh, from Harrison Gray. Um, yeah. Any other questions, uh, either uh, in the chat or maybe uh, Anlo or Pedro? I, I would have a I would have a few more, but uh, Anlo, Pedro, you have questions? Um, I was just wondering if you ever talked with uh, with geologists geologist or like um, about, for example, because you say that you, you have like this, this shaking and um, what kind of shaking exists for the earth, like for the soils, I, I don't know, like something that does not um, create this landslide, but that occurs often enough to stabilize your pile. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. I haven't talked to like engineering geologists and people who who are experts in earthquakes very much, but I do know mm, that what you say is very important. Like there's a regime of shaking where you're strengthening a hill slope and there's obviously a regime of shaking where you liquefy and fail a hill slope and the relationship of like, let's say the antecedent conditioning of a hill slope through many, many, many weak earthquakes, how that sets the condition for the response of a hill slope to a particular magnitude earthquake in a particular place. You know, in the experiments, mm, like the role of these agitations, it's it's kind of two-sided, right? Like on one hand, it's a kind of metaphor for mechanical agitations. And then on that could be like many things that are present in the environment, but then quite literally for the seismic shaking, right? Like you take the amplitude 
of your displacement, you compare it to the grain size and then the weight on it, and then you make more quantitative predictions and so on. Uh, I'm not there yet, but that's very much a direction to to go into to to do with concurrent monitoring of um, of real landscapes. I should also say that um, there's a collaboration. This density of modes framework um, is being pursued at NC State with collaborators at, at Scripps, with Bashan Wright and his group at Scripps, to look at the statistics of these velocity time series in both the experiments and in the field to maybe glean some statistical pictures that tell us about failure. So okay. that framework is being actively developed in a field context. Well, that was a super interesting talk. Thanks. And thank you for that. Yeah, I um I'll preface this by saying it's not my field, uh, but I you know I'm thinking about real landscapes and uh, um how weathering profiles uh, are structured uh, in the subsurface, uh -huh. and generally we have um well it depends on the environment, but I guess we would have a, uh, a underground. A, an interface between what would be a, a solid rock layer or a saprolite that grades into the surface that is somewhat in, in terms of its shape it mimics the surface and so you would have not a uh i guess uh a header a homogeneous uh amount of material like you have in the sand pile you would have something heterogeneous that mimics your triangle so yeah. do you know, have you thought of this and can that change the patterns that you're observing here? That's a great question. Um, I have done some experiments that are also, that I, I didn't speak about here, but that are um, enclosed in the paper where we looked at many materials where we made the surface rough. And in some, in the lead up to those experiments, I printed bottom boundaries that were wavy, that had topography to them, right? Okay. So, Creep still persists in those systems, but it turns out that the preparation of these things becomes more complicated when you have a, a bumpy boundary at the bottom that's more than just gluing grains, which is what we did in the paper that we published. But I, I printed and cut many different shapes and creep still happened there as well. Like the same relaxation and discrete motions and, and so on. So um, it's for sure present. My creep is definitely present and especially at like the critical zone interface and so on. And the way that I the way that I conceive and conceptualize the the richness of what happens with the critical zone in terms of like weathering and life and so on as types of disturbance that drive creep, like drive the rates of creep, you know, and then control the size of these rearrangements as you get aggregates, as you have plants, as you have subsurface flow and so on, as you have a grain size distribution from something that's chunky at that interface to something that is more fine at the surface. Like these things will all augment the, the basic bedrock phenomenology of like creep that's always happening, that's relaxing, that can be perturbed and tuned by disturbances and that is dictated by these discrete zones of deformation. So that's like my my best answer to how this worldview meshes with weathering in the critical zone and so on. But it's very interesting. And I think that elements that we see in nature that are important can be folded in one by one into experiments like this to observe their effect. Yeah, and that's very important. Thanks so much. Kind of question? Be interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it gives food for thought. That's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think that uh, this is a perfect uh, point to finish this talk, but also cap uh, the spring series of uh, Landscape Slides. Uh, thank you, Nakunda Shpande, for uh, being the, the panel speaker here. This was really a terrific talk. Um, thank you. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, everyone, for attending, for your questions, for your attention. I appreciate it very much. And so the talk will be also uh, on YouTube uh, and uh, will uh, gain a further viewership there. Um, as I was saying uh, at the beginning uh, of the, the talk, this is so sort of the final one for the spring series of Landscapes Live. We will start again in the fall. Uh, we don't have a full calendar yet, like a, a schedule yet, pardon me. Uh, we will probably start in October and uh, we will uh, keep you informed through the usual means, uh, uh, especially the, the mailing lists and, and social media. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a nice summer.
Thanks again. See you.